Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the, older, for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty, I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. Those who are victorious will inherit all this, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters and all liars, they will be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. The new Jerusalem, the bride of the Lamb. One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came and said to me, come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a mountain great and high and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down of heaven from God. It shone with the glory of God and its brilliance was like that of a very precious jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. It had a great high wall with 12 gates and with 12 angels at the gates. On the gates were written the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. There were three gates on the east, three on the north, three on the south, and three on the west. The wall of the city had 12 foundations, and one of them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. The angel who talked with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city, its gates and its walls. The city was laid out like a square as long as it was wide. He measured the city with the rod and found it to be 12,000 stadia in length and as wide and high as it is long. The angel measured the wall using human measurement and it was 144 cubits thick. The wall was made of jasper and the city of pure gold, as pure as glass. The foundations of the city walls were decorated with every kind of precious stone. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third agate, the fourth emerald, the fifth onyx, the sixth ruby, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth turquoise, the eleventh jacinth, and the twelfth amethyst. The twelve gates were twelve pearls, each gate made of a single pearl. The great street of the city was of gold, as pure as transparent glass. I did not see a temple in the city, because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives its light, and the Lamb is its lamp. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. On no day will its gates ever be shut, for there will be no night there. The glory and honor of the nations will be brought in into it. Nothing impure will ever enter it, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life.
Thank you, Miguel, for this reading. I was quite um, happy I did not have to preach on the chapter 20, but instead of 21. And then I found it was very difficult studying the chapter and finding all kinds of lines. And there are so many connections between this chapter and other parts of Revelation and to the whole of the Bible and uh, links to history. That's really amazing. It's dazzling. It's almost as dazzling as the image that is given here of the new Jerusalem coming down from heaven. I even got into a simple few words like there will be no sea anymore. And I thought, that's a bit of a pity. The sea is beautiful. I like to go to a walk on the beach. Um, but then finding actually that the sea was the place where the four animals in Daniel 7 or 8 are coming from that are attacking the people of God and disrupting uh, very much. So it's like the source of evil will not be there anymore. If you take it very literal, like there's no sea, no salt water anymore, well, <laughs> it's, it's difficult to imagine. And the first part of the sermon, I will speak a bit and show you a few things of what people imagined of this splendor of the bride of Christ coming down, Jerusalem descending from heaven. Because it's always our own ideas that we take in making these pictures, uh, reading the description and then it's in a way what we actually see or want to see. Um, so we'll share my screen and get to the PowerPoint I prepared and then um, This I should do is the other selling um, share screen. Okay, so it's about a new heaven, a new earth, and I emphasize the word new because. The word says that it is something of qualitative in an imaginable difference. It's not a replacement, a second type of a variation on. It's really new and it's very hard to imagine which is really new. We always take our own assumptions and put them in any image we make. So, and I should Click here. So we may imagine another heaven, a changed, improved earth. There are a few things that we like that will be there and the things we don't like won't be there. Uh, but every era in history visualized this as what the area knew, but a bit different. And I think it will be beyond imagining. This is a 11th century Spanish uh, Picture, it is square, the New Jerusalem. It has 12 gates and in the middle is of course the Lamb and uh, it's all there. It's very much in the style of art. I really like it. I think it's beautiful and it leaves a lot to the imagination. And to help the imagination, of course, it's written down the names uh, on the foundations of the apostles. And I think it, it focuses very much on the apostles, not so much on uh, the tribes uh, that maybe that are portrayed in the gate, so it's maybe more the foundations. So it's medieval time. It's an illustration from a book, as is the next one. And here we find one view of the New Jerusalem. You can see three gates, and it looks a little bit like a church because that's of course what people wanted to see. It must look like a church because the church is like how the New Jerusalem will look like. Uh, so this is from a monastery, Cloister's Apocalypse. We are in the 14th century now. Um, and it's clearly descending down uh, as written, but it's imagined as a church. But not everyone thought of churches in this time. There were other groups like nobility and they thought, well, it is more like a castle. And you can see a beautiful castle with many walls and ramparts, uh, high towers. Uh, it is a uh, tapestry here, 
and probably very suitable to hang in one of the big rooms of the um, castle uh, to say okay this castle is like what new jerusalem will be it's a place of peace of power of splendor of glory uh, and trying to be a kind of shade of what things are will be when they are perfect so the next one is an age further this renaissance and here the cities became very important far more important than the nobility's castles so really now the jerusalem is a city so it's portrayed as a city with the gates and everything um uh, and this, the front is an angel and john uh, in two positions because it's written twice one on, on the flat on the ground here and one uh, top of the mountain as the second time so here the new jerusalem is very much like a city and our city is like the new jerusalem move we further in time we get the age of enlightenment and they liked order so it's a very ordered plan of a city which treats as they liked to design them in these time it's a time where uh, the french gardens for instance were uh, built uh, very well organ organized straight streets uh, a big uh, place in the middle uh, not a square it's a round square you would say uh, but it's a place to gather and it's very well organized uh, really the enlightenment and again our cities as they are well organized they are like a shade of the city to come and you can see this uh, fairly catholic picture because in the top you see a man with a hat with three layers a tiara so it's like the pope who's on top of it um now you can see the holy spirit in the as a dove uh, under it uh, and uh, jesus of course with the cross very much pictured as a western white man uh, at the same time he's the shepherd of his sheep uh, so it's very much an enlightenment picture of what they visualized the new jerusalem and you can see what the thoughts of the age actually influenced uh, that image if we move to modern times this from a church uh, in the east from i think on the philippines i took it there so it's very much a mega city with a, uh, a skyline and um, a rainbow over it uh, the rainbow is actually mentioned in uh, revelation in a slightly different place uh, it's on the clouds so probably still descending or maybe it's just the top of the city because it's a very high city uh, you see the ideal city which has prestigious buildings and again our city is very much like the new jerusalem descending from heaven because we take our ideas and we put them in the vision we have of the new jerusalem there are some pictures that are less uh, gr have don't have so much grandeur and are big and actually i relate to them very much um, but first let's go to the even more literal one this is a square which uh, makes you helps you to imagine the size of the city so if you take the measures of what the angel measured uh, the twelve thousand stadiums and you would put it in such a way that Jerusalem is kind of in the middle. It would cover all this area, uh, almost all of Egypt, half Saudi Arabia, Iraq, Syria, and all the Middle East countries. And of course, uh, Israel itself, as well as Turkey. Um, it will be all covered by the new Jerusalem. So it's quite big because we like big and we have even uh, astronomical ideas about it and some people even say it's so big it would look like this actually the size of this new temple as it is described uh, is bigger than the size of the moon uh, so if you take the diagonal right through the middle it's bigger than the diagonal of the moon and if you would shave off the roundness to make it in a cube uh, so you had a square moon. It would be smaller than the New Jerusalem. 
I am afraid that science would say this is impossible because the continental plates could not carry the weight of a new Jerusalem that's this big, made of gold, which has a very high density and weight. So would this be possible? It is very impressive and it's really thinking in along our lines, uh, modern lines. It's big. Uh, we are conquering uh, the solar system and it, the New Jerusalem is in proportion to the solar system. Uh, and it is big. If we realize how big it really is compared to the sun, of course, it's very small. So I prefer a more human sized idea of the New Jerusalem that I can relate to. Because I'm not very certain I would be very eager to live in such an enormous building. Um, it looks there are no rooms with a view. It's not necessary, we don't need light. God will be there. God and the Lamb will be the light of the city. Um, but I like this picture. It's Tanya's Butler, the New Jerusalem. Just the idea of being there together, having very meaningful relations with the other people who are saved by the Lamb. Even the idea of to hold hands again with people that you just meet on the street. Uh, something I really missed. Um, and here it's pictured. So my idea of what would be very desirable is actually to meet with people. And in New Jerusalem, there will be lots and lots of people to meet who all will tell the wonderful story of Christ and how Christ became such a big part in their lives. Uh, we will not be able to stop talking and be in the presence of God himself and probably see him reflected in every face we meet on the streets. Think about it. Uh, uh, the enormous mass of people from every tribe, from every nation, from every language will be there and we will meet. Uh, there will be no differences of races anymore. In the description, there's even not mentioned that there will be people of different races because it's irrelevant. Uh, all languages that will be different, be important. That's all the languages we told the story of Jesus in, the languages in which we sang his praise. Uh, from every tribe, yes, and every family, from every group of people that descend from each other and are related to each other, but also relating between the tribes. Uh, um, so it's really something to look forward to. And I find it easier to relate to descriptions in the small prophets that every man will sit under its own, his own vine and his own uh, fig tree uh, and live very long lives in uh, in peace where shalom is yeah. so uh, that's a picture that i relate to um, i find when it's very literally getting into the text and analyzing what's there at some point it completely loses its attraction for me uh, because it's just grand and big and beyond my uh, own proportions but this i can relate to just seeing Christ reflected in all faces I see on the streets of gold. Uh, and it's of gold. It's nice to hear that's of gold, but it's not so important. Here's a lighter moment. There was a person who was very rich and he was very eager to keep all his possessions. But at some point he uh, noticed that end of life was approaching. So he went to his tailor and I said, I want a nice robe with pockets, but they have to be very strong. Why? Well, I want to take all my gold and put it in my pockets when I'm buried. So I will have it with me. I don't want to lose it. So, of course, his uh, robe was made. And when he got uh, unwell, he filled the pockets with gold and uh, lay down not to rise again and when he was buried according to his wishes he was buried in this beautiful robe with his gold stashed into it 
Some moments later, he um, actually arrived at Pearl's gates of the New Jerusalem. And as he has been a Christian, he was admitted. But people were really amazed. Hey, there's a guy who brought pavement. Because there's so much of it, it will lose its value in a way. It's something fairly simple. Uh, it's not something that you can distinguish yourself with anymore because it's become something that ordinary, which is also very beautiful. Uh, so there will be no distinction between people on basis of how rich they were. Maybe on basis of what they did with their riches. There is this beautiful story of, Abraham, um, of uh, the rich man and Lazarus at his gate, of course. Uh, and Lazarus was at the bottom of Abraham while the rich man was outside uh, uh, because he did not use his riches to alleviate the suffering of the poor, but just for his own comfort. Uh, and we must admit that we have a lot of comfort. And what will comforts of the New Jerusalem be if we have all our comforts? Uh, if you go to the sermon uh, in Luke where it said, uh, oh, whoa, you rich, you have already have your comfort. Uh, um, so it's, it's quite a matter of what we do now with what we own and what we are. So our ideas of perfection, they are very much limited. They are imperfect. And I think improvement is not a matter of changing the world towards our ideas of a perfect world, because they are not perfect, the ideas. But we, us being changed towards God's idea of a perfect man, Jesus Christ. Uh, and uh, we will be changed to his image, because if we seek the glory of Jesus, it will be reflected on our faces. We will re, re we will actually recognize Christ on each other's faces in the New Jerusalem. And also nowadays, uh, now in the church, in our fellow men outside, in our neighbors, uh, where we can recognize Jesus. And while we see him on each other's faces, we become more like him also. This is quite a process, of course. It's not we are immediately changed the moment we become a Christian. Um, it's a vital step, but it's the first step on a long journey of having our ideas changed, our imperfect ideas changed into God's ideas. Um, because uh, if you think that New Jerusalem is coming down from heaven, it's not made by human hands, uh, fashioned in our way. It's not a tower of Babel built up to reach into the heavens. It's actually God's creation coming down from heaven. That's why it can be perfect. An ideal and perfect world is the work of God, where man attempts to create a paradise of a heaven on earth. The result is hellish. Uh, there are many attempts to create a paradise on earth and the big problem there is it's such a wonderful idea that it justifies all means uh, you get into the idea uh, of lenin that in order to build an ideal communist world it's okay to sacrifice 90 percent of the population uh, it's okay uh, to uh, kill people who oppose your God-given government. Um, it is okay to, in the name of justice, commit crime. And it is not. You can only reach God's purpose for your life with in the framework that God has given. That is it's a calling, but you have to do it led by the spirit, not fueled by anger. Uh, with your eyes on the positive, on the face of Christ, led by his spirit. 
uh, not fueled by the anger that wants to destroy. And it should be within the limitation that the Bible sets. Uh, um, so murder, theft, destruction are not the idea that the Bible gives as means to improve this world. Uh, we are not the ones who will make the perfect world. That will be God's work. God's work in us is to make us the perfect man he has in mind. So the idea is that we will reflect Christ more and more. Not that we build an ideal world based on fa uh, faulty ideas that we may have what is <coughs> ideal. And that's a long way to go. Um, there's always grace on that road. It's a step-by-step -step approach. And I was quite inspired by um, Gilbert quoting, not singing, Amazing Grace. And I'm going to share a fragment from his um, story, if I can. Okay, I will share screen again. And in closing, I'd just like to not sing, but quote Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Are you found? Can you see? Have you been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb? In the second verse, it was fear that taught my heart was twas grace that taught my heart to fear and grace my fears relieve how precious that moment i first received his grace has grace taught your heart to fear <clears throat> are you in awe of god the judge you know what it is, the fear of the Lord. And then, has that same grace of the Lord relieved your fears? Third verse. Okay. Turn on original sound and to link this story with perfection and development, I would like to go into the story of the writer of this beautiful text, John Newton. And shocking as it may be, he was a slave trader. And the verse, it was grace that taught my heart to fear, is actually a description of a storm he encountered before the coast of Africa and he thought he was going to die. That was the moment he started to cry out to God to save his life. That was the grace of the first moment he started to believe. Was he immediately changed and did he repent of his evil ways? No, he didn't. He continued the trade actually and quite long kept uh, shares in the company that traded. Gradually he came to repent of what he did and how it changed his life, please watch the movie Amazing Grace, that's about the abolishment of slavery, because John Newton is there. And he does penance, actually, for the grievous sin he feels he has done. 
he realizes that he condemned fellow human beings to a miserable life and it was deeply deeply sinful it did not start with him realizing this was bad he first had to be changed by grace and gradually his ideas changed and then he became a very important factor in actually influencing those who abolished slavery now we have a dilemma on our hands should we draw down his statue should we abolish the song amazing grace because it was made by a slaver i don't think so we should realize that he was a sinner as he confesses in the song deeply in sin part of an enormously sinful system and structure but it was grace that also led him to change his attitude let it be a reminder to us that even if we bow, have bowed our knees there may be thoughts that are unwelcome to God that are abhorrent in us and that need to be changed in order to make Jesus both Lord and Savior you may be saved but all areas of your life need to be brought under his jurisdiction under his rule he needs to become your king in all areas of life and that means that attitudes like racism need to go completely but we can't use violent means to change this world into a perfect world it still will be God's work done God's way if we want to achieve this and I'm very happy to be in a church where I'm confronted on a daily basis or on a weekly basis uh, and I see many people of all kinds of backgrounds languages from all kinds of tribes and descent and I am proud to call them my brothers and I'm even more proud of the one who made them into my brothers linking and bonding me to them with a deeper bound that can be found anywhere deeper than it can be found anywhere else realizing that we have been bought by one owner that we can call ourselves even bond servants of our lord which puts on us on a completely equal level with every human being all have sinned all have fallen short of the glory of God because the offer of redemption and salvation is for all also for all who want to hear and want to come and continue to be changed seeing God's glory reflected on each other's faces it's a deep lesson to learn because evil and even the evil of racism is deeply engraved on every heart I think it's a tendency we all have and that can be uh, removed by just communicating with one another and recognizing Christ's face on every face Amen Elmer, would you lead us in song? Yes. So the song I chose um, relates to be in the presence of God, eh? to be in his city. And uh, I like the, 